Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast, the show that brings leading minds to discuss the latest challenges and trends transforming and modernizing the energy systems and the utility industry of the future. And a quick thank you to Wes Moreau, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. I'm your host, Jason Price, Energy Central Podcast host and director of West Monroe, coming to you from New York City. With me, as always, from Orlando, Florida, is Energy Central producer and community manager, Matt Chester. Matt, are you ready for today's guest? I sure am, Jason. You know, here on the podcast, we definitely pride ourselves in talking about the most timely of topics in the utility industry. And I think today we're going to hear more in depth about one of the more buzzworthy news items in the past few weeks. I'm excited for that. Agreed. Well, today we're going to get an inside perspective from one of the more significant announcements from the past few months related to nuclear energy. Specifically, we're pleased to welcome as our guest, Robin Manley, the VP of New Nuclear Development at Ontario Power Generation, or OPG. At the end of 2021, Ontario Power Generation announced the selection of the GE Hitachi BWRX300 as its first small modular reactor. This announcement made quite the wave in Energy Central as people are eager to see the first SMR come to the commercial grid. So we're thrilled to hear Robin was open to chatting with us about that and about how OPG is broadly seeking to implement a cleaner energy mix. As way of introduction, Robin has spent over three decades with Ontario Power Generation, working his way through various roles at facilities including Darlington Nuclear Generation Station, Pickering Nuclear Generation Station, and now today where he leads his team in developing new nuclear assets. Robin is a treasure trope of experience and expertise. So enough talking about him. Let's talk to him. Robin Manley, welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. Thank you very much, Jason and Matt. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk with you and your listeners about the things that Ontario Power Generation, or OPG, is doing to bring clean energy options to the table and specifically our small modular nuclear reactor program. Robin, let's start at the basics. How has Ontario Power Generation approached the ongoing energy transition? What are the goals you've set? And do you have a general framework of how you intend to reach any milestones you've set? Definitely. A few years ago, we started looking at what to do about climate change. And last year, we issued a climate change strategy, which has two really major uh, goals in it. One is to be a net zero carbon company by 2040. And the other is to enable jurisdictions in which we operate to be uh, net zero economies by 2050. And to do that, we developed a variety of sort of key pillars as to how we were going to go about it, including uh, sort of other clean energy sources, refurbishing our existing nuclear generation site at Darlington so that it will operate for another 30 years, repowering and, and expanding where possible our hydroelectric fleet, working on electrification of our province so as to decarbonize other sectors. We've established two programs so far, our IV charging network for electric vehicles and our Power On electric bus program to support the Toronto Transit Commission and nuclear reactors, small modular reactors as another clean energy source. Great. Well, I'd love to dive deeper into the power generation mix you've been talking about and planning to implement in the wake of the type of climate urgency you've raised. So, are you moving to renewables at full speed ahead? Are you looking to natural gas as a bridge fuel? What is the ideal mix in the coming years that we should expect? I'd say that the ideal mix really varies from location to location. What are the natural uh, resources that you have available to you? Do you have a large hydroelectric capacity in your local neighborhood, in, in your state or your province, your country? Are you a place that has a lot of sun a long time during the day and a lot of the time during the year? Do you have a lot of wind? And if you don't have a lot of capacity in those areas, what are you going to use? And this is where nuclear, which can be built practically anywhere, comes into play as a safe, clean, reliable baseload generation source. In Canada, we have set targets that will not allow us to use natural gas 
for very much longer. By 2035, the Canadian electricity grid is supposed to be carbon neutral. So un unless carbon capture and, and storage really takes off and succeeds, that's not really going to be an option. We are using in Ontario uh, natural gas. In fact, my company, OPG, does have a natural gas subsidiary, but it is investigating the use of hydrogen and our ability to make hydrogen in a clean way. So non-GHG emission uh, creation of, of hydrogen as a clean fuel. And can that be used to displace diesel in, in uh, transportation fleets? Can that be used to replace natural gas as a kind of peaking energy source on the system for when you need additional capacity to backstop renewables? And how do all of these things work well with your existing hydro and potential nuclear assets? So we really view this as an all tools in the toolbox are necessary. That's what the international experts like the uh, United Nations IPCC says, we're going to need all the clean energy resources. That's what the International Energy Agency says. And we agree with that strategy, which is why we have a multifaceted approach. Terrific. You mentioned nuclear, and we teed that up at the beginning in the intro. So Ontario Power Generation has made some notable news in recent months regarding being a leader with nuclear technologies, such as the small modular reactors or SMRs. Let's talk about that. Give us some more specifics around this and what kind of progress you've been making in this area. Absolutely. So Ontario Power Generation already operates a fleet of 10 can-do reactors, and we actually own another eight that are operated by Bruce Power in Ontario. And we've been running nuclear power plants safely since about the early 70s, early 1970s. But some of these can-do reactors are, are coming towards the end of their lifetime, which is our Pickering station. Others at Darlington, we are refurbishing to run another 30 years. So we were looking at what's the next generation of nuclear technology. And this term, it's kind of like a brand, if you will, of small modular reactors has become uh, much talked about over the last few years. So we started looking into that, and I'll talk more about that later. But we started looking into small modular reactors as being smaller, simpler, faster to build, lower capital cost to get into place, and with advanced safety features that have been learned from all the generations of reactors that went before them. We think that this is a very promising tool to deploy because it's nuclear is the lowest GHG emissions, the lowest carbon emitting technology in the world, according to a UN panel. And we have found that they have been a tremendously effective resource for clean, reliable baseload power in Ontario since the 70s. Talk to us about what went into the technology decision to implement SMRs and specifically what's unique about the BWRX 300. Right. As we started looking at the potential for small modular reactors to be a useful tool for us in OPG and in Ontario, starting in 2019 and going through the end of 2021, so over a, a three-year process, we did a, a multi-phase very, very deep dive into all the SMR, all the new nuclear reactor technologies that were out there. And we started by basically saying, okay, there's something like 150 potential technologies that are being developed that are, are brand new, innovative, exciting, but we're, we need some screening criteria. So first off, it's like, it's got to be the kind of right size of plant. We were looking for something that would be very well suited to replace coal plants and again, at a, a simple, small, low capital cost. We settled on something a, a size of around 300 megawatts of electric output, which is a typical kind of size for a coal plant. And we said, okay, we don't want something, you know, for geopolitical reasons, we don't want something that's coming from Russia or China. So looking at the Western world technologies based out of Canada, the US, Europe, for example, and we screened it down to a sort of a top 10 list of ones that looked like they had the right technological readiness level that would be deployable on a time frame that makes sense for us. And we were looking at something to be deployed by about 2028, which made sense for us in terms of our electricity grid demand. And it's also soon enough that it would then be useful to be deployed by fast follower companies and jurisdictions in other parts of the world for them to help fight climate change. So we took that top 10 list. We did a relatively short evaluation based on available information from those 10 companies, and we screened it down to, to six. And those six, we did a due diligence dive on in 
2020 to identify which ones could credibly be ready on our time frame, had the right safety features that we wanted, and were, were seriously interested in deploying first in Canada, which is one of the things we were looking for. From there, we screened it down to three, which was a company called Terrestrial, GE Attachy with its BWRX300, and X Energy with its XE100. We looked at those three for the last year, all through 2021. We had three uh, sort of engineering teams with people looking at the cost, the safety features, the supply chain, technological readiness, licensing in Canada, compliance to our existing approved environmental assessment that we have for our site at Darlington. And we picked what we thought was the best fit. The reason we picked the BWRX 300 ultimately is it was the best fit for us, for our site, in terms of our timeline, in terms of cost, safety features, licensing, and its ability to provide this clean, reliable baseload generation and to really kick off a fleet of these reactors, not just in Ontario, but hopefully in other provinces in Canada and hopefully in other countries. And we've already seen a great deal of interest from other jurisdictions in this decision and potentially following along uh, behind us with this technology. Thank you for that. So the decision to make this leap seems to have been backed by a lot of thought. Were there other external factors? You mentioned some of the geopolitical, but you know, what about more locally, the regulatory requirements of the landscape working for and against nuclear energy? Sure. In Ontario, there's you know a lot of support for new nuclear because there has been such a successful use of it in our province over the last five decades. So good support here in Ontario. At a Canadian federal government level, the support is is a bit more nuanced. They're open to additional nuclear, and there's been some uh, limited funding from the federal government for nuclear technology uh, development, both in Ontario and New Brunswick. So that's good. The regulatory regime in Canada is very open to new technologies. Our regulator, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, has a a robust regulatory framework, but it's got flexibility built into it in terms of technology. The regulator has expressed an interest in uh, enabling innovation while maintaining its safety above all mandate. You know, the sort of regulatory framework is there. In Canada, we have a strong nuclear supply chain that has essentially been recapitalized over the last few years because of a large investment in refurbishing, basically rebuilding the nuclear power plants at Darlington and at the Bruce site. The supply chain is in good shape and is ready and wants to engage in uh, manufacturing and building the components for these, these SMRs. And we see an opportunity for Canada to be part of a global market and global supply chain in deployment of this technology Obviously, working with our partners in the U.S. where where this uh, technology is based out of GE Attachy. And so, you know, we intend to work closely uh, with the supply chain in the U.S. and in Canada and uh, hopefully commercialize these in other parts of the world. Okay. well, the future is, of course, developing in terms of power demand, right, with vehicle electrification, building electrification and so on. And the potential production of hydrogen being two of the most significant factors. So how does the specter of this growing demand influence the direction OPG has gone? Yeah. So when we look at the demand for electricity and clean power, it isn't enough to just have a carbon neutral electricity grid. It isn't enough to decarbonize the electricity grid because just using my province as an example, but it's same idea elsewhere. Our electricity grid in Ontario is already about 94% carbon free. It's one of the best in the world, along with France. Others aren't so clean, but no matter where you are, every jurisdiction uses a lot of fossil fuel in vehicles, transportation, home heating, industry, and other sectors. So even if we have a clean electricity grid, it's not enough to fix the climate change problem. So we need to decarbonize other sectors And we in Ontario think that the best way to do that is essentially to electrify most sources of power. So whether that's making clean fuel with clean electricity, uh, whether it's battery storage, whether that battery storage is pumped up by wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, however, but you need the clean energy source, you need the storage capacity, and you need the clean fuels 
for things that don't run on batteries or directly connected to the grid. So with that fundamental structure in mind, what we've been doing is looking at hydrogen and there might be other clean fuel options that you want to produce, not by burning natural gas or burning coal, obviously, because that's dirty hydrogen. That's actually worse than not having hydrogen at all. You want to produce the hydrogen in a clean way. We're definitely investigating that. And we've done forecasts within our company of what that kind of demand forecast looks like. We've also talked with the independent electricity system operator in Ontario, and they've got their forecasts. Essentially, what it's saying is we need to approximately double or triple the amount of clean energy that we produce. This is in parts of the world highly, you know, have a high producing economy already, but in in parts of the world that have a lower standard of living that are still building up their economy, that are still industrializing, the challenge is even greater. They're going to have an even greater demand for clean power. So there's really an enormous amount of infrastructure that is going to have to be built around the world that produces this clean power. And that's going to lead to a lot of jobs in the manufacturing, construction, distribution sector. So I I see a lot of opportunities ahead of us. I know you've also talked about using the expertise you're gaining in these technologies to assist other regions and companies to implement SMRs toward climate goals. How exactly would that work? Honestly, we don't know exactly how it's going to work, but I'll give you some preliminary insights anyway. OPG, because of a combination of factors, our existing excellent nuclear power plant operations, our very good performance in our nuclear refurbishment program, where where we're bringing this $12.8 billion program in on budget, on schedule, which is relatively unusual in big nuclear projects. We've demonstrated that we can do major nuclear projects well. And so we have, with an existing approved site for new nuclear, nuclear excellence in operations, nuclear excellence in refurbishment, we have the opportunity to be the first mover in the small modular reactor space, where we recognize that not everyone, not every company or jurisdiction might have either that experience or risk tolerance Someone needs to go first. It's been identified as the most fundamental challenge is everyone's watching who's going to go first. So we've decided we're going to do it, and we're going to build this first one on schedule, on budget, demonstrate that it can be done well, that it can be operated safely, and we will be figuring out all of the engineering, all of the costs, and, and then be willing to share with others so that they can learn from our experience and hopefully then implement their own programs, building upon the work that we have done. You know, exactly what those structures will look like, you know, those kind of details need to be settled. But that's one of the things the worldwide nuclear programs uh, do very well, whether it's working through the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, whether it's working through the World Association of Nuclear Operators, users groups on certain technologies, we share and collaborate better than any other uh, industry that I'm aware of, because we all want to be successful. We want to operate safely and we want to operate effectively and efficiently. You know, we're willing to be the leaders in this one and hopefully help others to follow along and work with us. Well said. Well, now it's time to put you to the test with our lightning round. So Robin, this is where we dig into who our guests are behind the expertise and getting to know you on a more personal level. So your responses will be just one word or phrase. Are you ready? Sure. Great. Your dream vacation. Cycling in Tuscany. Your go-to comfort food. Pasta bolognese. Best advice you've ever gotten. Don't worry too much about things you can't control. What will you be doing for a career if not in energy? Lead guitarist in a rock band. What are you most optimistic about? Tom Brady wins another Super Bowl. (laughs) That's great, Robin. Now we want to give you the last word. Given everything we've discussed and knowing you're speaking directly to an audience of utility decision makers, what piece of advice do you have to offer from your experience implementing the clean energy mix at OPG? What lessons do you hope to impart to your peers so they don't have to learn them on their own? Thanks very much for the opportunity to be here with you today to share some thoughts. I'd say that in in this area around implementation of major projects, for example, new nuclear technology, it's not something that can be done easily or lightly. It is definitely 
a significant challenge that takes a lot of work. And so our program for small modular reactors is based upon our experience that we've gained through our nuclear power plant and nuclear waste operations over the last 50 years. It includes a great deal of, of public engagement and stakeholdering in Canada. It includes lots of meaningful engagement with our Indigenous communities, which is absolutely crucial because you need the, the support and acceptance of, of the people in the local neighborhood where you work, uh, where you live, and where you operate. And then the project itself, you need to do all of the necessary in-depth planning up front so that you have the engineering complete to the level you understand the manufacturing. You aren't going ahead and starting to construct the plant when you're only, say, 30% engineering design complete. That road leads to failure. You need to have the engineering complete. You need to have done the planning, which means you need to have invested the time and the money and the resources up front to plan the project well. You know, that's a challenge to do because you're you're taking on a significant commitment to do that work before you make the final decision. But if you do that, what we have demonstrated with our refurbishment project, what we've demonstrated with our, our major hydroelectric projects at OPG, is if you do that planning, then you actually do the project right. It comes in on schedule, on budget, and then you can declare success because you did what you said you were going to do. You want to be a trusted operator that's uh, accepted by your community and doing what you said you were going to do is so fundamental to that. So take the time to do the planning right. Robert Manley, it was a pleasure to have you on our show. And we hope that you and the listeners keep the conversation going in the comments section of the post with this podcast episode. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much. You can always reach Robin through Energy Central, where he welcomes your questions and comments. We also want to give a shout out of thanks to the podcast sponsor who made today's episode possible. Thanks to West Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital workforce transformations. West Monroe brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure advisory on transportation electrification and hydrogen, ADMS deployments, data and analytics, and cybersecurity. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. And we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast. <music>